I want to start by saying that criminal law, the course that I teach, is going to seriously disappoint you. <laughs> You're not going to like it. And I'm sorry about that, but it's just what it is. You already think civil procedure is boring, so when they start talking about pleadings and personal jurisdiction, and it actually turns out to be pretty cool, you're going to be all psyched, like law school's great. By contrast, when you get to criminal law, you're going to be thinking law and order, and I'm finally going to be able to tell my buddy what to do when he gets pulled over in a traffic stop. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that that's not this course. That's criminal procedure. It's awesome. Take it in the spring, especially if you think you might want to practice criminal law, or if you ever just want to talk to somebody at a cocktail party, take that class. We teach it in two forms, criminal investigation and criminal procedure survey. But that's not this course. This course, we're going to start droning on about Latin words like mens rea and locus potentiae, and you're going to think, what am I doing in law school? So all I'm trying to do today is tell you why you're studying things that sound boring but really aren't, okay? <laughs> Criminal law is super important. You could say it's much, much more fundamental than many of the other things you study in the first semester. And I know this because I talk about it with my kids. Now they're all teenagers, but when they were littler, one of them, while I was driving him to school one day, we're listening to NPR, Mommy, what's prison and why do people go there? And the answer is, some rules are really, really important, Stephen. And if you break them when you're an adult, we say you did a bad thing. And we punish you, mostly by putting you in prison. That's like time out for grown-ups. <laughs> Criminal law explores the set of rules that govern social conduct in that way. Like torts and contracts, it is about disputes between people and resolving those disputes. But unlike uh, torts and contracts, we're not just talking about how to resolve the dispute. We're picking sides, by picking sides, we're talking about something different. We're talking about the state intervening to decide whose interests are fundamentally paramount and who deserves the formal condemnation and punishment by the state. And that's, that's really when the law starts being hands on bodies. It really matters. So those are the rules of criminal law. The course isn't about what those rules are. No one's going to tell you the elements of theft or prostitution or whatever. Um, it's about what those rules are like and how we can understand them. Now that sounds pretty abstract. But what we study in criminal law is exactly the questions that you would want to know about a system of condemnation and punishment if you were just trying to figure out what it was like. Okay, And I know this too from my children because they've asked me every question that we study in criminal law. What if I hit my brother, but only because my sister pushed me? That's the voluntary act requirement. We start, I start the course with that. Other people do it differently. What if I hit my brother, but I didn't really mean to? If you believe them, we're going to study mens rea and think about when accidental acts can constitute crimes. What if I hit my brother, but he hit me first? Self-defense. We have, to, we have to figure out what the limits of those rules are to know whether that's a legitimate uh, argument or not. What if I hit my brother, but only because my sister said she would beat me up if I didn't? Duress, OK? Can you rob a bank with a gun to your head? What if I hit my brother because I was drunk? Which you might think is a strange question for us from a seven-year-old until you realize that it took place right after the conversation about why the big houses on Rugby Road decorate their front lawns on the weekends with red cups. <laughs> What if I uh, hit my brother because I'm crazy, OK? What if I hit my brother but I didn't know I wasn't allowed? Mistake of law, OK? These are all the questions that you're going to study in criminal law. And they're about the nature of the uh, kinds of rules, the kinds of requirements that we use before we say that something is not just prohibited, but prohibited in a way that justifies the condemnation and punishment by the state. Now, criminal law is kind of hard um, because while basic principles govern criminal law, there are some normative and political principles at the heart of what we call crimes. Those are not 
what you're studying. All criminal law uh, is embedded in the United States in statutes. And so it's a little bit, it's actually far more statutory than the other classes you're going to take this first semester and even mostly during your first year because you need to understand the statutes as well as the cases that interpret them and how to figure out the principles that govern the interpretation of criminal law from those cases. Um, it's also complicated by the fact that we're not studying, this is a national law school, we're not studying any one criminal code. So we're trying to prepare you for the variety of approaches that states take and the federal government takes. And we do that by simplifying the criminal law into two general approaches, uh, idealized versions of the states in a way uh, that are represented by the model penal code and traditional common law requirements. And though those are the codes of nowhere, they will help prepare you by highlighting the controversies that are at stake in the criminal law and the, the basic approach approaches that states take to those controversies. Now, different professors study di very different things in criminal law. It probably varies much more than any other course in terms of the different sections and what they'll learn than any other course in the first year curriculum. But there are basic six kind of areas that we tend to study. One is what the minimum qualities of a, cr a uh, the, def the definition of a criminal law can <laughs> has to have. So, for example, I said that all criminal laws uh, are embedded in statutes, that we, we don't criminalize uh, through cases, okay? Why is that so? Well, there's a pr principle called legality that governs what can constitute um, a crime in the United States. Our legal system is committed to that principle of legality, which means that crimes have to be defined by legislatures in advance in writing, okay? And we have principles like vagueness, which say that a statute can't be so uh, uh, vaguely defined that it doesn't tell you anything about what's actually prohibited. So those are about the qualities that a criminal definition has to have. We also talk a lot about the components of crimes. Actus reus. You can't, I mean, we don't, the state won't punish you for coveting your neighbor's wife but they will punish you for killing your neighbor so to get him out of the way, okay? Why is that? Because crimes have an actus reus component, an objective uh, uh, aspect of a crime that's in the world, and we study what that objective aspect has to look like. Um, it's not just about conduct. Driving is fine. Driving while intoxicated, well, those are the conditions under which driving can be prohibited, okay? We also talk, answer questions like, well, when is non-action sufficient to constitute a crime? Omissions. So that's the components of the crime in terms of the objective components. We also have mental components of the crime, what we call mens rea, usually about what's inside your mind, what we call the guilty mind. That's, you know, that governs things like when accidents and mistakes can constitute crimes. When we, do, we hold you blameworthy for the consequences of your actions, even if you didn't intend them, or even if you didn't in, engage in risky behavior. And when and what kinds of risky behavior have to take place. So that's a second big category. The other categories are a little bit smaller, but we talk about things, at least we start to talk about things in criminal law and then in subsequent courses, about how early in the process of you trying to commit a crime can we punish you? Um, what about, uh, or in, in my kids will ask, but, but if I catch them before they actually do the act, but I didn't even do anything yet. The hand raised, about to punch your brother, that's good enough for me, that's an attempt. So we talk about threats and attempts and, and other inchoate acts. Um, what if you complete the elements of the crime, but for very good reasons? We could think about justification defenses, self-defense, defense of others, it's something I study a lot, the public authority defense, and the lesser of two evils defense. Um, we talk about when you might be blameworthy but not responsible for what you did. That's the gun to the head case, at duress, or insanity, infancy. Um, and some of us study particular crimes in course to reveal how some of these 
principles play out in particular complicated areas of law. I focus on rape and homicide, um, but other professors choose other offenses. Studying crim, I just have to say, is incredibly frustrating. And it, it, you're going to want us to tell you things you can write down that are doctrines and rules. But it doesn't work that way. And that's not most of the project. Maybe much more so than you would like, especially at the beginning of the course, all you're trying to do is figure out how to read cases so that you can figure out what the principles you want to derive from them uh, are. Uh, but it's all worth it, because uh, violating the criminal law has enormous consequences. As I've said, condemnation, deprivation of fundamental rights, even death. And everything else you study this semester is really just about money. So it's kind of trivial. <laughs> Allow me to add my welcome to those you've already received. Uh, I'm going to uh, differ from my colleague and tell you that, uh, unlike crim law, contract law is probably exactly what you expect, uh, exactly what you thought about uh, when you thought about going to law school. Because, and, and I'm going to try and convince you this morning that contract law is the most important foundational course in the first year of, uh, in the first semester of law school. At least that is until you get to property law, which I also teach. Um, <laughs> contract law is essential to understanding law and the role of legal institutions in our society. Every one of us has contracted for something important in our lives, and I would hazard a guess that each of us is currently contracting for something important in our lives. In fact, uh, it's not a guess. I think I can prove it with a couple of uh, relevant examples. You, the promisee, by paying those large tuition dollars, have induced this law school, the promisor, to provide you with a first-class legal education in exchange for your tuition dollars. And we, we, by the way, thank you. Uh, I, the promisor, have agreed to and promised to teach sections D and F, contract law this semester, induced by the promisees, the University of Virginia Law School, their promise to provide me with a salary, and more importantly, tenure. Uh, now, what's interesting about both of these contracts or agreements, yours with the university as well as mine, is that nowhere is there in writing a formal contract memorializing the terms of the respective agreements in exacting detail. Yet every judge would agree that you currently have a valid contract that is enforceable by you and that, and we're going to talk a lot more about this uh, in a few minutes, and that contract provides you with the remedy should the state, which actually obviously the university is an agent of, uh, take your money and not provide you with the legal education that you expected as a result of that contract, that agreement you have with the university. Shifting from the individual examples, on, on a macro level, contract law plays an important function in every sophisticated modern society, including, of course, the United States. Contract law is what we lawyers, and there are only a few of us up here that are actually lawyers, um, what we prefer, refer to as private law as opposed to public law. Not con law, not crim law, fed courts, men law, and not a statutory law course like uh, what you've been exposed to this morning, civil procedure. What you're about to be exposed to again, civil procedure. Contract law is about agreements, express or implied, oral or in writing, between individuals or entities, private or public, voluntary agreements between two or more of these entities to transfer assets, which I'm going to roughly term property this morning, <clears throat> from one user to someone else, and that someone else will always be, uh, we will always assume throughout as a higher valued user of that asset of property. What is important to note at this point is that contracts like your other first year courses is a foundational course and integral to your understanding of the law. Contract law is crucial to your understanding of law and its central place in the study of law should be obvious to you even at this early stage of your legal academic career. I think the study of law, especially the first year of law school, is all about the study of contracts, either directly or indirectly. And I think I can demonstrate that every first year course, and perhaps every course at, taught at the law school, is tied to contracts. I'll start with just the first semester first year courses. Uh, let's begin with an easy one, crim law. 
You'll be taking that this fall, obviously, and what you'll discover that, this is my summary of crim law, uh, is that uh, crim law base is all about ensuring that individuals voluntarily enter into contracts to transfer an asset instead of allowing might makes right, which would allow individuals to take an asset if they value it more highly, if they want it more than the current uh, possessor. Torts, we're gonna have torts this fall. Torts is all about determining the value of an asset or property that has already been transferred when the parties cannot voluntarily bargain in advance for the transfer of that asset, when it's not possible to contract. But as you will see, we would prefer that they voluntarily contract, so there are problems, and that's what torts addresses. Last but not least, and what you've heard a lot about this, semester, uh, this morning, civil procedure, which appears to have nothing to do with contracts, but actually may have the most to do with contracts. As I'm going to address in a minute, contracts would be meaningless unless they are enforceable. As we will see, and as I will address, there's a mnemonic that I give my first year class, my first year students, that represents all of the issues addressed in contract law, and that mnemonic is P-R-I-D-E, pride. And the E stands for enforceability. Well, that E, of course, gets enforced in the courts when there's litigation, and that litigation is governed by the rules of civil procedure. And indeed, out there in the real world that we'll refer to, most litigation involves contracts. But what about the first year courses next semester? Um, con law, Article 1, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution, no state shall pass any law impairing the obligations of contracts. The centrality of contracts is in our Constitution. Finally, property, the other first year course I teach. Property informs us regarding what can be the subject of contracts, which entitlements or private rights are capable of being transferred, and they change over time. Which touches upon the last point I want to make before I turn to the specifics of contracts and that mnemonic I was talking about, uh, pride. Contract law, like property law, is not a recent doctrinal area, like say environmental law, family law, elder law, can go on and on. Uh, bodies of law unknown at common law. Contract law has evolved over centuries from biblical or canonical law to Roman law to modern law, uh, what you will hear throughout uh, the first year of law school as common law. Contract law is an excellent course because it melds the old, it weds the new, and it just, it's, it's a panoply of issues that um, will astound you as you go through your casebook. It's very complex. But let me give you that mnemonics. We're running a little bit late and I'll try to be quick. Contracts can be divided into five key issues. Uh, all of your cases in contracts will implicate one of these five issues. Contracts can be thought first and foremost uh, as asking this key question, which promises are enforceable? That's the P in pride. Which promises are enforceable? Now, we're going to see that P also serves double duty because we're going to have to have a process to determine which promises are enforceable. And I can go on and get metaphysical and say, well, first we need to determine what is a promise, but I'm going to assume with your stellar education, you can discern a promise from an assertion or a question. And so I'm going to start with the assumption, and we do in contracts, that you know what a promise is. So if I say to you, I promise to meet you at Hotcakes, which is a barracks road, for lunch at noon, that's a promise. Question is, though, is it enforceable? No, it's not. But it's a promise. Is it morally binding? Maybe. Should I feel bad if I break the promise? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on why. <laughs> Can you sue me if I don't show up for lunch? No, you can't. So enforceability, the E in pride, is also very important. You have promises. We all make promises. We, make, I, I have, we probably make promises every day. But only a certain subset of those promises are enforceable. So we've got a P, promises. We start with that. We've got another part of P, which is, well, what process determines uh, which promises are enforceable? And we've got an E, enforceable. Why is E so important? Which I'll get to in a minute. So here's what the process looks like in our system of law, briefly, as to determine which promises are enforceable. Promises which are made as part of a bargain. That's about as simple as you can get, an exchange of promises. That's going to tell us 
And there are various theories to support why that's important. Moral, functional, utilitarian, law and economics. Um, but you'll address that in your contracts class. And, but you'll see that it's basically a bargain. It's called the bargain principle of contracts. And it's objective. When, viewed, when the party's actions are viewed objectively by a neutral third party, has there been a bargain? So we've got a P, which stands for two things. We've got an uh, E, enforceability. And the next letter is I for interpretation. How are the words comprising the promise, assuming it's enforceable, interpreted? We have to have a stable interpretive framework by which to parse the words, whether oral or in writing, used in the promises. We can't have customized or idiosyncratic meanings that change over time for, say, a word like agreement or purchase. So we will develop, and you will develop in your first year uh, contracts course, an interpretive heuristic or framework that will be used to parse the words. And that I also includes the scope. Do things that occur before the contract matter? Do things that occur after the contract matter? What is the scope of meaning for that interpretation? So we have P, E, and I. The next letter is the one that at least my students find the hardest to grasp. D, for default rules. Because there are several types of default rules. We don't ask people to draft customized contracts. It would be too costly and it would take too long. So we have default rules, sort of off-the-rack rules that apply to uh, contractual agreements. And there are many types. The three most important are immutable, mandatory, they're mandatory, uh, majoritarian, what most parties would use, and the hardest one is a penalty default rule. But you'll study all about default rules uh, in your contracts class. Probably the most important letter in that acronym is R, remedies. You have a promise. It is enforceable, it is subject to interpretation, stable interpretation at low cost, and someone has breached the promise. Well, he needs to provide remedies. If the remedies for a breach of promise involved a bow, a curtsy, or an apology, they'd be meaningless. Nobody would enter into contracts. So, when you think about contracts, Think about pride, P-R-I-D-E. And I guarantee that all of your cases will implicate, and all of the issues you'll address in contracts will implicate one of those five areas. Uh, finally, I want to close with this personal remark. You're about to embark on the study of law, and I am envious. Envious because you're about to enter a new and exciting world that will not only challenge you, but will also enrich you. I can predict with near 100% certainty that the first year law experience of which you are about to embark will change you for the better and the study of contract law will play a large role in effectuating that change. I wish you all good luck, good studies. If criminal law is the class where uh, you're going to have your expectations of the class challenged and contracts is the class you're going to walk in and say, that's exactly what I expected, you know, this meets my expectations. If you're anything like me, civil procedure is the class where you just have no expectations at all. You know, I could stand here and tell you whatever I want, and you would say, "Okay, that's that's civil procedure." You know, um, except I suppose for the fact I, I walked by and I, I heard Ben Spencer give you, you know, one of the world's foremost experts on civil civil procedure give you this crash course, and so I feel that now I have to actually tell you what civil procedure truly <laughs> is about. So, okay, there are six things that I cover in the civil procedure class at a very high level of generality, and uh, most people cover, although, uh, as you've probably gathered from some of the other remarks, folks teach classes differently, so don't be surprised if you, if you learn other things um, other than the six things I'm about to tell you, or some of these are not covered in the class. Okay, what are the six things? I like to approach the, the six things from, from the perspective of, um, you know, what are the problems? What are the problems we are trying to solve? And why do we have this system of civil procedure uh, to begin with? So one problem that we have, um, and I, you know, maybe problem is the wrong way to put it, but just one difficulty, one challenge, uh, is an outgrowth of our uh, federal system, our unusual federal system where we have all these different states and you've all come from different parts of the country. So just hypothetically, someone comes 
from Pennsylvania, someone comes from, oh, I don't know, further south, like Florida. There's a student here from Florida, there's a student here from Pennsylvania, and regrettably, after we're done with orientation, you all are driving out of the parking lot, and the cars bump into one another. And one of the first questions you might ask yourself is, well, what happens if somebody wants to sue the other person, or let's say the two people want to sue each other, where do they go? Where do they go? So one set of problems that's, uh, that's discussed in a civil procedure class is the where do you go problem. Do you go to Pennsylvania? Do you go to Florida? Do you stay in Virginia? And you may think, well, it seems pretty obvious that in this instance, these people stay in Virginia. It's probably actually, you know, this is a simple example, that's true. But if we change the facts just a little bit and we say it's not now, it's three years from now when you all are just about to get ready to graduate, to leave the school, and somebody's going back to Pennsylvania, somebody's going back to Florida, and the same car accident happens, well, where do they go now? Where do they go? Is there a certain place in the country that they have to go in order to sue? And it may not surprise you that we have to have a set of rules. It can't just be a free-for-all. We have a set of rules about where do you go within the country in order to bring that lawsuit. And those rules are um, governed by uh, a couple of doctrines that uh, you'll be exposed to in civil procedure. Doctrines of personal jurisdiction and venue. And so many of you, I think, are going to start here in your civil procedure class. It's going to seem totally inscrutable, in part because the cases you will read are old. They're old cases. Um, and uh, the other part of it is that the doctrine develops over time. So these are kind of unusual aspects of the civil procedure class, which is a little bit different from some of the other classes, where you're exposed to older cases that are sometimes a little bit harder to read just because just they're using English that we're not all that familiar with or concepts that are not familiar with. And, um, and the fact that evolution occurs and the civil procedure class is your first introduction to the notion of the evolution of law over time. But if you just think in terms, as you're addressing these cases that seem hard to, hard to deal with, um, of the overarching problem. What's the problem we're trying to solve? We're trying to solve the where do you sue problem. Um, and if you think in those terms, I think some of the more complicated terminology that you'll find in the cases will become easier to approach. All right, so there's one where do you sue problem, which do you sue in Florida? Do you sue in Pennsylvania? But there's another where do you sue problem, and it's another outgrowth of our, of our unusual federal system, and that is we have a federal government, which you all are familiar with, with the president, Congress, and federal courts, and then we have a state set of state governments, and we have governors, state legislatures, and state courts, and those governors, they're signing laws, legislatures are enacting laws, and there are state courts, and you may think to yourself, well, if I go to downtown Charlottesville, I see a state court, and I see a federal court, so let's say we want to sue in Virginia, where do we sue? Do we sue in the state court, or do we sue in the federal court, and we have a set of doctrines to allow us to figure out that where do you sue problem. And those go by the name uh, of subject matter jurisdiction. And I, as I was walking by, I was hearing Professor Spencer explain um, some of uh, that doctrine to you, um, but without going into too many details. At a very high level of generality, it's actually totally intuitive why you would end up in federal court. One of the reasons why you might end up in federal court is people from two different states are suing one another. We call that diversity jurisdiction. Diversity because people are from diff diverse states. So that's one way in which you end up in federal court. Another way, well, there's something that's a national problem. And the federal uh, Congress and the federal president, they've enacted a law that uh, addresses this issue. And you can sue under that law. And that, that we call federal question jurisdiction. So some reasons why you might end up in a federal or national court as opposed to a state court. Both of these doctrines, personal jurisdiction, subject matter jurisdiction, these are intended to solve the where do you sue problem. All right, so we also have all these people passing laws, and there's another outgrowth of the federal system that is uh, that we're going to have to solve, and that is, all right, you know where to sue. We figure out where to sue. What law applies? You know, we have Pennsylvania enacting its laws. We have Florida enacting its laws. We have Virginia enacting its laws. The federal government, which law applies? That is a problem that is quite often addressed in various forms in the civil procedure class, and so something that you all will become familiar with. We end up in the right court, 
So now I'm moving on to the, the fourth uh, issue that uh, you'll, you'll confront in civil procedure. You end up in the right court, and uh, you just have to know what the rules are about how the trial is going to unfold. And there are some pretrial things that happen. There's a trial. There's post-trial things that happen. There are appeals. And uh, so civil procedure is a uh, class that exposes you to the sequence of steps that are important during this, uh, this course of trial. Unlike, say, a course like criminal law or contracts where you're being exposed to an idealized set of, you know, this is how a state might approach this problem, the way in which we teach civil procedure is we teach you what the rules are if you end up in federal court. And so there are certain rules that have been promulgated by this rules committee. They're called the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, and you learn the important ones. The important ones about what do you do when you first file your complaint? What do you do if somebody's filed a complaint against you and you want to get rid of the complaint? You file a motion to dismiss. What do you do after there's some factual, what we call discovery, to figure out what actually happened during this car accident? And you have to file, uh, you, you want to file some papers to say, let's not go forward with this trial. This trial will be really expensive, and here are the reasons why I should win before we actually um, need to go through the societal expense of a trial. Um, those are called summary judgment. Then we have a trial, uh, and we'll talk about how the trial is constitutionally required, and you'll learn a little bit about the federal constitution. And uh, then we have some post-trial motions. So um, the course of the trial, the fourth big topic in civil procedure. Finally, um, if you think about the hypothetical that I'd given you of these two people getting into a car accident, um, uh, so this is the fifth topic, this is actually the uh, penultimate, not the final topic, but finally in sort of what might happen in a single case. Um, we have these two individuals from Florida and Pennsylvania that get into a car accident, somebody sues in Florida. Let's say the whole case is litigated in Florida and we get a judgment, somebody wins, somebody loses. And the person who loses says, you know what, I don't like what happened, I'd rather just go somewhere else and bring a lawsuit. I'd, bring, I'd want to do this whole thing over again. And there are a set of rules that tell you when you can do the whole thing over again and when you cannot. And those rules are about the law of judgments or the law of preclusion. We sometimes call it preclusion. And you may have heard these terms of res judicata or collateral estoppel. These are all just complicated ways of saying that this has already happened. You know, we've already done this. We've already litigated this issue. We've litigated it to a judgment and we ought not to open this all up again and do it one more time. And then the very final thing, the, the, the hypothetical that I've used throughout is about a car accident right in front of the law school where two people get into, um, uh, into some sort of litigation. But just imagine now if we complicate the, uh, the hypothetical and we say, no, it wasn't two people. It was one car and a bus. And there are lots of people on the bus. So we might have like 15 people involved in this uh, piece of litigation. And let's say we complicate it even more and we say, you know, it's not one individual hitting another automobile. What we're talking about is a big pharmaceutical company selling drugs all over the United States and lots of people, thousands of people, millions of people are saying, I was injured by that pharmaceutical. Where do you go to sue? What law applies? And what's the trial going to look like? Those are some of the issues that we address in civil procedure. So once again, welcome. Um, you're going to hear this all over again. I talk really quickly. Don't think that you have to have memorized all of this at this point. You'll have a whole semester to learn it. It's really great to be here. Thanks. So let me begin my overview of torts with a personal tort story, my own personal tort story. So a couple of years ago, on a really windy day, after it had been raining a lot, a huge tree came crashing down in my yard. And I'm talking about a huge tree. It was probably a two-story tree before it fell into my yard. And there were branches everywhere. It was clear to me that the tree had come from my neighbor's yard. So I went next door and said to my neighbor, hey, did you know your tree fell in my yard? And he said, no, I didn't. So he came out and he took a look. And I said, have you called your insurance company? And he said, no, you don't understand. It's your tree now. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean it's my tree? It came from your yard. And he said, it was a natural disaster. It was an act of God. I don't have to pay for that. 
Maybe you ought to call your insurance company. This was not good news. It seemed to me that if somebody else's tree comes crashing into my yard and I haven't done anything to cause it, that person ought to pay. So I did some legal research. Now, doing legal research in torts is harder than you would think because there's no book you can go to that tells you about liability for falling trees. Tort law is judge-made law. The way you have to identify what the rule is that applies is you have to find a case like your case. So I had to dig around in Virginia cases. Thankfully, we now have online sources. You don't have to go back to the books. Uh, but I had to search around and try to find a case about a Virginia case about trees falling in people's yards. Well, there weren't any Virginia tree cases about trees, so then I broadened out and I said, well, maybe there'll be some cases about other kinds of natural stuff that goes from one yard to another, like a rock slide or, um, or a soil, wet soil, kind of careening into somebody else's yard. Well, it turns out there weren't any cases like that either in Virginia. Uh, so then I had to look in the law of other states to see if there are any other cases. Now, of course, those cases would not be dispositive in Virginia, but the judge who heard my case might be persuaded by the reasoning in those cases. Unfortunately, when I did my research, it turned out that my neighbor was right. If an, it turned out that the rule in virtually all states is if neighboring property is injured by a natural condition of adjoining land, that's considered an act of God, and there's no liability. It was my tree. I was going to have firewood for the next 10 years. <laughs> but then something really interesting happened. As my neighbor and I were walking back to the street, he said, I knew that tree was going to go. I said, what did you just say? <laughs> He said, yeah, I think the root system was really damaged by all that rain we had and that last big storm. Last week, I noticed that that tree was leaning into a maple tree. It was just a maple tree that was holding it up. I said, you're kidding me. You knew that tree might come down and you didn't do anything about it? That tree could have come down and killed somebody. He said, but it didn't. <laughs> But now the facts were looking a lot better <laughs> for a case against my neighbor. Under the first set of facts, my neighbor wasn't at fault. I guess you could say he planted the tree, but that seems like kind of a stretch. But under the second set of facts, my neighbor was at fault. He just told me that he knew that tree would fall, could fall. He saw it hanging in the maple tree, and he knew it was just a matter of time. Now, he didn't intend for it to fall, but he took the risk that it might fall by not doing anything about it. And he knew that if a big tree like that came down, it would cause a lot of damage and it could actually hurt someone. So I, thinking like a lawyer, got my neighbor to repeat what he had just said in front of a friend of mine who happened to be visiting at the time, just in case he tried to change his story. Then I did some more research. Sure enough, the rule was different if my neighbor knew that the natural condition posed a serious risk of harm. In that case, I learned my neighbor could be liable. In that case, it was his tree again. <laughs> now, this story teaches us two important things about torts. First of all, torts is deeply factual. It depends on how you tell the story. In my tree case, one fact made the difference between liability and no liability. My neighbor was only liable because he knew that the tree was damaged and likely to fall. This knowledge made him negligent. Without this fact, I would not have been able to frame a story that could lead to a successful lawsuit. Second, these two stories illustrate two different possibilities for tort liability. I could only win a lawsuit by arguing that my neighbor was at fault. There had to be evidence that my neighbor was careless in some way in the way that he took care of the tree or didn't. Negligence liability is the largest category of tort liability. 
Suppose, on the other hand, though, there had been liability under the first state of facts, when there was no evidence that my neighbor knew the tree was dangerous. This would be strict liability. Strict liability is liability without fault. Now, in certain kinds of cases, tort law holds people strictly liable. Supposing I found out that my neighbor had decided to keep a pet tiger in a cage in his home. And supposing that pet tiger escaped and injured my dog, my neighbor would be strictly liable for the injury to my dog. One important topic in tort liability is to try to figure out when the law turns from negligence to strict liability and why that is. In addition to negligence liability and strict liability, there's one other category of liability in torts called intentional torts. Supposing my neighbor saw me sitting in a lawn chair in my yard and pushed the tree over on me. He didn't like me very much. Now his conduct was not just negligent, it was intentional. Intentional torts are viewed as particularly heinous because they involve conduct that is intended to cause harm. Now one last topic I want to cover is how tort liability is different from criminal liability. Supposing again my neighbor intentionally pushes the tree on top of me while I'm sitting in the lawn chair. How do I know whether that's a tort or a crime? Well, the answer is it could be both. I could certainly sue my neighbor for damages for an intentional tort. But especially if I'm hurt really badly, the local prosecutor might bring criminal charges against my neighbor for malicious wounding or some other crime. Lots of ink has been spilled in trying to make a distinction or define the line between criminal law and torts. In general, though, we criminalize things that we think are really, really bad, and we want to prohibit them regardless of whether they cause harm, although they usually do. So for example, it might be, a, you, you could be liable in criminal law for reckless driving even if you didn't run over anybody. By contrast, tort law requires some sort of injury. Tort law says you decide whether to act in a way that creates risk, and if you harm somebody, you've got to pay. The civil criminal distinction also determines who brings the suit. Criminal cases are brought by the government, and if, but if I want to recover damages against my neighbor, I have to sue him uh, in civil court. Interestingly, criminal liability doesn't usually account for damages to the victim. The only way you get damages is if you bring a, 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 uh, an additional civil suit. Two final pieces of advice about torts. You might want to ask yourself, am I the kind of person who likes rules and orderliness and clear answers? Any of people like that out there? If that's you, you're not going to like torts very much, <laughs> especially at first. Because torts doesn't have a lot of clear rules, just a lot of arguments on both sides. But that's what's really valuable about studying torts. You get a lot of practice making legal arguments on both sides of an issue, using the facts to tell the best story for your client. And that's an essential legal skill, and torts is a really good place to practice it. But here's my second piece of advice. You're going to get really good at that, making arguments on both sides of an issue. But don't let that dull your moral intuitions. Thinking about what is fair, what is just, what is beautiful, are also a really important part of what it means to be a good lawyer. So do you want to know how my story ends? After I did that additional research, I promptly wrote a letter, clearly indicating I was a lawyer, to my neighbor's insurance company, reporting what my neighbor had said and making it very clear that if my neighbor, if I filed suit against my neighbor, I would probably win. I suggested that they could save themselves a lot of trouble by simply paying for the damages, and I helpfully gave them a list of how much that would cost. They sent me a check. <laughs> the moral of the story is, do not commit a tort against a lawyer.
around here we often uh, shorten legal research and writing to LRW, so you may refer to may hear it referred to as that. And in LRW, we will pull together a lot of the things that you're gonna learn in your other classes, whether it's learning to interpret statutes like the Model Penal Code, like Professor Harmon was talking about, whether it's thinking about making both sides of an argument, like Professor Armacost was just talking about. We're gonna bring those things together. And as you've just heard from the, the other professors that have talked, in all of your other first year classes, you're gonna focus on learning the substance of a particular area criminal law, contracts, civil procedure, torts. You're gonna to learn how to analyze that law by reading statutes and cases and thinking about the arguments on both sides. LRW is fundamentally different from those other first year courses. We'll also work on your ability to analyze the law in legal research and writing, but we're gonna add two specific skills that are crucial, just as the name of the course implies. First, we're gonna help you to learn to research the law. That is, to go out and to find the relevant legal authorities that apply to a given legal situation. So, when your neighbor's tree falls into your house, you can go online and find the cases in Virginia or elsewhere that would apply to that situation so you can look through and figure out whether or not you can write that letter to the insurance company. In other classes, the cases and statutes are typically given to you, either in case books that you'll be buying very soon or in other course materials. They typically give you the materials that you'll need to analyze and read. But in our class, we're gonna teach you to learn to go online or even go into the books if you need to and find the legal authorities if you don't know where they already are, which of course is what you have to do in the real world. Second, we're gonna help you learn to organize and communicate that legal analysis that you perform, and typically we're gonna do that in writing. That's most of what we're gonna do in our class. And this is the place where you may, uh, as you've heard some people say, this class may differ a little bit from your expectations. So you may come into legal research and writing thinking like, oh, writing's right in the title. I love to write, or this is gonna be a writing class. And we are gonna talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of writing, so any of you that are wondering, how do I use a semicolon, <laughs> if you're not very sure? <laughs> or is it okay for me to start a sentence with but and and? The answer is yes, and you should. Uh, we are gonna talk a little bit about that, but that's actually a pretty minuscule part of our class. Most of what we call legal writing is actually learning how to assemble, how to put together legal authorities and thoughts in order to build legal proofs, that is to prove a proposition or to advance an argument. Okay, and that's a very important, it's kind of a unique skill set. Sometimes it actually looks a little bit more, if any of you have done things like geometric proofs, like in high school or college, right, proving that angles look, or, look similarly or are equal. Sometimes legal writing actually takes on a bit of that. It actually can resemble something more like a proof than what you may think of traditionally as kind of writing or prose. So we're gonna do a lot of that. We're gonna learn how to build those arguments and really prove legal propositions. And that takes a really, really high degree of specificity and evidence, maybe more than you've done before. So we're gonna learn how to build those arguments and, and communicate the analysis in writing. So how are we going to do that in our class? Well, in LRW, learn by doing. You are the lawyer. We put you in scenarios where you have a client, an uh, individual or organization who has a problem and they need legal advice from you, the lawyer. It's your job to go out and find the relevant law, to analyze the law, and then communicate that analysis back to your client or your supervising attorneys in a way that your client can understand and put into action. So in the fall, you take on the role of an advisor. You'll write three memos of increasing complexity where you're analyzing a client's legal question, you're helping them determine what their options are. And these problems, depending on which professors you have, take on a range of topics, many of which sort of reinforce the things that you'll be learning in your first year courses. So you may have problems that deal with a torts problem or a contracts problem or interpreting a statute and see how it bears on your client's situation. And then in the spring, what you're gonna do is you'll take on the role of an advocate. So now you are the advocate. This has the civil procedure element. You're in a court. And all three of the legal writing professors, the, the procedural posture is you've been at a lower court and now you're on appeal. And so you're gonna write an appellate brief arguing to that appellate court. And then you're actually gonna do an oral argument. You'll present an oral argument to a group of alumni and upper level students who are acting as judges. Each year we have more than 100 alumni 
practicing lawyers and judges who come back to the law school to serve as judges. So you'll get to interact with them. They will ask you tough questions and make you prove or establish your argument. Um, it's a challenging uh, exercise, but it's a great way to cap off the year and to show off the skills that you've learned. I know that I speak for the other legal writing professors, Professor Buck and Professor Ware, when I say that we are looking forward to working with you throughout the year. If you have any questions, feel free, please, as you're here during orientation, to stop by and see me. And again, welcome to the University of Virginia School of Law. We're glad you're here. <laughs>